Oh, yes, sir, we can start now. Yes, okay. Should we, should we, should I share my screen? Uh, also, I'll introduce you first and then we can start. All right, perfect, perfect. So, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Aditi. I'm a member of MSFC unit of AMSA India. And uh, today we have uh, with us uh, Dr. Surakshit Batina, also known as uh, on Instagram icon, Dr. Baby Maker. Dr. Bettina is a uh, fertility specialist with fellowships from France, UK, and US. He's the founder of the prominent Indigo Women's Center here in Chennai. He's a known TEDx speaker and, and is the winner of the IAGE Young Excellence Star Award and the winner of Icon Award in 2019. He's also performed the world's first laparoscopic management of uterine rupture. We're lucky to have, us, have him here amongst us today. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much for taking the time out to join us. Thank you so much for that introduction, Aditi. It is lovely to be with all of you today. I'm so glad, uh, you know, uh, AMSA has actually invited me to talk to all of you. So I hopefully influence a lot of you to take, uh, you know, the OG field because it's very, very exciting. You know, I, I, ever since I started this off, I was always hoping that, uh, you, you know, I, I was just trying to find my niche. But then I realized there's so much in OBS and Gaini that I enjoy. And I hopefully, uh, you know, think that one most of you also would be, you know, liking to join OG as well. Uh, so I'll be talking about one of the sections of what we do as obstetricians and gynecologists. So I'm going to share my screen right now. Yes. <sighs> All right. Is the screen visible? Yes, sir. Perfect. So you're able to see my screen. You're able to hear me. Yes, sir. Okay. So my topic I've chosen for this is that I want to talk to all of you about ART. When I talk about ART, I'm talking about assisted reproductive technologies. Okay. So I think uh, Aditi has already given a brief about myself. What I wanted to tell you is as a gynecologist, you have so many options which you can get into. Uh, for example, I practice reproductive medicine. I practice cosmetic gynecology. I also practice, uh, you know, laparoscopy. Uh, although my OBS practice is not as, you know, high as others, my gynec practice is quite good because I decided to focus more on gynecology. So, you know, if gynecology is something that interests you, then definitely, you know, your scopes are much wider. Of course, you know, obstetrics also has a very wide approach because high-risk obstetrics is all, uh, you know, a subject and, you know, it's everything in itself. So I think definitely it uh, depends on an individual and their taste. But anyway, uh, coming to the topic in hand, uh, I think we cannot really skip a talk about IVF without showing you this beautiful picture. Uh, this girl right here, her name is uh, uh, Lewis Brown. She was the first baby to be ever born through IVF in 1978. Okay. Imagine by the time her sister was born, she was the 40th baby to be born. So you can imagine how fast and how quickly this whole so-called experimental therapy at that time has taken off. And by the time her sister was born, she was the 40th baby. So you can see uh, the the demand and the need for such a procedure in 1978 itself, right? The other thing what you need to understand is that um, Lewis Brown today is, you know, has two children, but both the children were conceived naturally and they also delivered naturally. So this shows us that not just because you have or had an IVF baby, these babies don't have to produce IVF babies because that is a big myth which was there. So if in case, you know, I have IVF, should my daughter or, you know, son also suffer from infertility? Not at all true. It is not generational. Okay. So coming to some of the statistics, I wanted to show you this one where, you know, 10 to 15% of married couples in India are currently suffering from fertility. But when you put it in perspective, this 10 to 15% comes to 27.5 million people. And do you know how many, uh, you know, of, of this 10 to 15%, how much percentage actually goes and visits to the hospital? It's only about 1%. So you can see the number of IV. I'm sure you would have just gone to one street, uh, you know, or just around your college or anywhere. You will see at least 10 or 12 infertility centers. 
even with all of this, there is still going to be a lot and lot of need uh, for IVF. And you will see why as well. Not only IVF, I'm talking about any ART procedure. Uh, previously, you know, everything used to be as a, uh, you know, female factor. Everyone used to think that, you know, it's because of the female factors that uh, women are, su sorry, that uh, the couples are suffering from infertility. But it's actually not true. 40 to 50% of them are due to the female factors. Whereas 30 to 40% are attributed to male factors. And if you had to know the reason why they did IVF for Lewis Brown, the reason was uh, the lady had blocked fallopian tubes. So initially, IVF was done only for that purpose. Nowadays, we use IVF for so many other things, which I will be explaining to you in the coming slides. Okay. Yeah. So for the question... Why is infertility on the rise? I think a lot of you guys, you know, have sent me the questions on, uh, you know, an infertility and what it is and why it is on the rise. I, I think around eight or nine of those questions were why it is on the rise. I think these are the main things which I have found. The number one factor, in my opinion, is always stress. It's either from your work or stress from social media. We all feel that social media by itself is not very stressful. See, I might be on social media most of the time. You might think I'm on social media most of the time. The, but the amount of time I actually spend consuming content is actually very, very less. I use this as a channel to push out content and probably give out information to the public, which is useful. But when you consume a lot of uh, social media, it definitely, definitely leads to a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress. And this has been proven. The reason why these don't come out is because these social media companies are so strong that, you know, they take active stances so that such studies don't really get published. Right. The other reason why it is on the rise is, of course, you know, the number of party goers have been increasing as well. You have a lot of uh, drinking going around. And, of course, smoking did come down when compared to the past, but still it is still present. Nowadays, people are also vaping. In fact, that has also caused some kind of concerns for people who are having infertility. Um, unhealthy diets, I think this has to, I don't even have to say this, everything what we are eating nowadays is not organic. Everything comes from, you know, refrigerated or, you know, it's just uh, fried or, you know, all uh, these fast foods, all of them are unhealthy diets. So they also contribute to infertility. Environmental toxins, of course, you you cannot walk in Delhi today, with uh, because you know it's about the about the uh, sorry because of the amount of fog which is around, you know all the smog. It's all because of environmental toxins. All this is also improving and increasing the infertility. Uh, of course, nowadays women are looking at trying to delay childbirth because they want to you know pursue higher careers and they, they want to pursue higher positions in their job. Um, you know, for higher studies, women are delaying their childbirth for after 35 years. There is a solution for that as well, which I will be discussing with you in the coming slides. And last but not least, we're all sitting in front of our laptops for doing our researches or whatever it is, we are becoming more sedentary than before. Okay, so these are all the reasons why infertility is on the rise. Now, when you look at some of the male factors, which I have found very alarming, is that there has been an increase in the number of men who come to me with sexual dysfunction. And I think this also has to do with the diet. In fact, most of the factors which I spoke about previously does have a specific impact on our males. So it has an impact on sexual dysfunction. You are also having abnormalities in the sperm parameters or in some situations there are no sperms at all. So these are the situations what can happen in males. Coming to females. Okay, before females, I'll talk to you about some of the WHO trends. You will find this very fascinating. Since 1973 to 2011, there has been a 52% decline in sperm concentration. 52%. Okay, that's a huge number. And there's been a 60% decline in the total sperm count. So not only that, imagine when I started off you know, doing MBBS, I used to read, you know, in the WHO, the guidelines used to say 50 million sperm was considered to be normal. You know what is normal today? 
it is 15 million so where is 50 where is 15 and again you see the trend and it's going much much more faster and it's declining much faster as well so these are the parameters okay if you guys want to do you can go ahead and screenshot it i'm not going to talk too much into it it's just the who you can find it anywhere online coming to some of the female factors of infertility what all can you have uh, because of all the you know reasons i have given you previously women can have ovulatory disorders where they are not able to release one egg every cycle instead of releasing the egg they are forming tiny cysts called as polycystic ovarian disease i would say one out of every four women in india at least in south india for who i have seen have some bit of ovulatory dysfunction and they do have some amount of PCOD, whether it is mild or it's moderate or it's more, they do have PCOD. Nowadays, there's another condition on the rise called as premature ovarian failure, wherein usually people or women hit menopause only after 45 or you know 50 years of age. But women who have premature ovarian failure, they hit menopause much earlier. By the time they're around 28, they lose most of their follicles. And by the time they're 30, they become menopausal. So there are some signs and there are some indications for you to how, how we can identify these women who are premature ovarian failure. They'll usually have very less amount of spotting, less amount of bleeding, and they will not have too much. So it's either because of PCOD or because of POF. And the easiest way to find this out is by doing a test called as an AMH. Anyway, I'm just going off topic. But let me ta talk about all the uh, female factors, right? The tubal factors. I think this was the reason why they had to do IVF for Lewis Brown's mother in the first place. Uh, and uh, tubal factors, sometimes both the tubes can be blocked or one of the tubes can be blocked. That also hampers your fertility. And of course, we all know tumors in the uterus. If in case the position of this tumor, as in a fibroid, is abnormal, then you are going to have issues. So uh, the position of the fibroid is very, very important. See, we all know 50% of women have fibroids. It's not required that all women require some kind of procedure. It's only that if it is inside the uterine cavity uh, over here, at which point you will expect some kind of infertile, uh, infertility issues. And of course, finally, when you know we as doctors don't have any uh, words to use we like to use the word called unexplained you know because we know we, there is no answer <laughs> all the tests look normal we don't know what else to say so we say it's unexplained infertility so this also is a possibility and this also is one of the reasons why many people and probably one of the most frustrating conditions for the patients in fact you know many of them they come to me you know, uh, and I, I do all the tests and they're all fine. They have been trying for pregnancy for five years and it never happened. And, you know, that is called unexplained infertility. And and that by itself, you no, know, is very, very stressful for the patients. Now, coming to treatments, I'll go one by one. What do you do if in case the count is very low, sperm count is low, what is it what we can do? Number one, you can start the patient on antioxidants. Say I'm not going to go into too much detail because it's not really required for you at this particular point. You just have to have an overview of what are things we can do. Okay. So you can start off your patient with antioxidants. If uh, you know that works out well and good. Otherwise, you can go in for a procedure called as an IUI. So you can see over here the IUI being performed where basically what they do, the sperm sample is collected. They process the sperm. They separate the good sperm from the bad sperm. The good sperm alone is made into a tiny pellet. It is fed into this. Are you able to see my mouse pointer? No? Okay. All right. Anyway, so you can see over here, there's a tiny catheter over here. So this catheter is fed into the uterus. And then finally, the sperm is injected inside. So when that happens, you know what? The sperm is exactly where it has to be. If the sperm has low motility or the low amount of count, then at that point, directly injecting it into the cavity will improve the chance of pregnancy, especially for someone who has a low count. Now, what if the patient has no sperm at all? That is, he's azoospermic. At which point, we have a procedure where we can directly collect the sperm from the testis we have procedures called as TISA and MISA, where we go ahead microsurgically, we aspirate the sperm or we remove the tubules and then we give it in for the collection of the sperm. 
but the problem is if in case you get the sperm in this method right you will not be able to uh, store the sperm as in you have to use the sperm immediately because most of the time uh, men who have some kind of issue in the production of sperm the sperm might be very uh, fragile so the main focus of this uh, sperm will be to go ahead and uh, uh, for, for for the use of fertilization so it has to be used immediately so it cannot be, you know, you cannot use the sperm aspirated by TISA or MISA to, you know, freeze it for later use. That will not happen. Now, what if a woman has an issue like a fibroid and it is inside the cavity? At which point we can go ahead and use, um, you know, laparoscopy, which what we what you can see over here, using tiny ports. We push in the camera and we push in the working elements. And if you have no idea what laparoscopy is, I urge you to go ahead and have a look at my channel where, you know, I post everyday surgeries on gynecological surgeries and I explain all the steps. So if that is something that interests all of you, please, you know, follow me on my Instagram channel there. But otherwise, if you have anatomical issues, you can always correct them with, you know, laparoscopy. What if the woman has ovulatory disorders? So I'm going one by one. So if the woman has ovulatory disorders, as in she's not ovulating, there are three things we can do. Number one, you can do ovulation tracking, as in either by using, you know, the LH kits, you know, those little kits where they take one drop of urine, put it on the kit and see whether you have the two codes or not. If the two codes are there, which means the LH is positive, as in the LH surge has happened, right? And the other one, what they can do otherwise, if they don't want to do that, they can go ahead and do an ovulation tracking by a folliculometry. This is the ultrasound folliculometry can be done. Or they can go ahead and induce an ovulation. So by taking medications like letrozole or clomiphene citrate, you can induce ovulation. Okay. And finally, what you can do, you can have something called a super ovulation. Whereas instead of just releasing one egg, you can release maybe around 10 to 12 follicles, depending on how many other follicles are there on both the ovaries. That is called super ovulation. I'm not going into too much detail because, you know, of course, it's going to require a lot of time. I'm just giving you an overview of everything in infertility. So you don't really miss out on anything. If there's something in specific you want to ask me at the end of the session, you can ask me. And now what do we do? We have corrected the sperm or we have collected the sperm and we have corrected the, uh, you know, ovulation issues as well. So what do we do next? If in case ovulation is not happening, if in case the tubes are blocked, then we take a single sperm and we inject it into the egg. So this is called as the ICSI or, you know, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So how do you get the eggs out of the body? It's very simple. You give anesthesia, you have a very thin, long needle. It go, You go and poke it directly into the ovary and retrieve all the follicles. Okay, it is done under general anesthesia, daycare procedure. Patient comes in the morning, she leaves in the afternoon. How do you collect the sperm? Of course, through masturbation. Once this sperm is collected, they go ahead and they inject each of these eggs with each sperm and then the embryo is formed. Okay. Now, even in trying to get these, now I've told you, right, we go ahead and use a long needle to retrieve all the follicles. How do you go, how do you go ahead and uh, get these follicles? Of course, there are a couple of protocols. Previously, no, they used to use this thing called as GNRH long protocol, whereas, whereas they used to start the stimulation from 21st day of the previous cycle take it all the way to the 11th or the 12th day of this current cycle. Okay. Now what they have done is the same GNRH long protocol. We have made it into a agonist short protocol. Okay. So you can see over here, we started out on the day three of the stimulation and only within the 11th or 14th day, we go ahead and get all the follicles. Of course, there are also ultra short protocols and you also have, uh, you know, dual stimulations. There are so many other protocols, but right now the most popular out of, uh, if you have around uh, 10 IVF units, eight of them will be doing short protocol because that has become very simple. And within one cycle, you get all the follicles what you require. 
Now, imagine you have got the follicles. Imagine you have done IVF. Imagine you have, sorry, IVF or ICSI, whatever it is. You got a good embryo. Okay. What do you do about these embryos? How do you maximize chance of implanting this embryo into the uterus? The first step, what they do, they used to go ahead and they used to transfer the embryo on the third day. Okay. With the invent or the with the advancements of the culture media, what they're able to culture the embryo outside for longer duration of time. So they were culturing it for five days now, and we are going ahead and we are transferring it, uh, transferring the embryo inside. So the chances of an embryo to implant are much higher when it is a blastocyst. That is a day five uh, or a day six transfer when compared to a day three transfer. So we have. We have made all our protocols faster. We have also made sure that the embryos, what we get from these protocols are better. Is there any way to improve this? Of course, we can always again improve this. We have some new technology called as time lapse, where basically what it does is it takes pictures of the embryo every few hours. So by the end of three days, you can see how beautifully the embryo has been growing into two cell, three cell, four cell, six cell, and the morula stage. So when you can see this beautiful, you know, the the life or how it is, uh, you know, dividing, you can take an idea on which one or take in a call on which one has the highest chance of implanting and then you can go ahead and transfer it. Okay. So that is the latest technology which people are using. Okay, is there any other way to improve the transfer? Of course, because you will be, and I told you about the GNRH agonist and antagonist, isn't it? These are the things which we usually use for the patient to um, get the number of embryos outside. But the problem is because of GNRH, you know, what happens? The endometrium will not be in a very ideal scenario. So what we started doing, we started freezing all of these eggs. Sorry, the embryos. We started freezing the embryos so that we can transfer it in the next cycle while only focusing on the endometrium. We wanted to grow the endometrium properly and then go ahead and transfer the embryo. So this way, you are again improving the implantation even more further because before you have got all the eggs outside, that was more your main focus. And this time, implantation is your main focus. So for that, what you're doing is you're going ahead and preparing the endometrium and then later transferring this unfrozen embryo. Once you freeze it, the process of unfreezing the embryo is called as thawing. They will thaw the embryo and then they will transfer it inside. Okay. Is there a way to improve this uh, implantation again? Yes, of course, you can. There is this new thing called as endometrial biopsy, where what we do is called as an ERA biopsy. We take the endometrium, they analyze this uh, endometrium with maybe millions of other women who have had embryo transfers before. They will see which one your maximum having a chance of having uh, endometrium receptivity. For example, if in case it is receptive on the sixth day or it is receptive on the seventh day, you will know exactly by the report. So the report will tell you either it's receptive, pre-receptive or post-receptive. Okay, depending on that, you can do a individualized embryo transfer. It's also known as personalized embryo transfer or PET. Okay. Okay. Imagine if in case this woman unfortunately has premature ovarian failure. She did not realize she had it. Is there a way she can be, uh, get pregnant? Of course. What they can do, they can take the eggs from another woman. They fertilize it with the sperm of the husband. This embryo which is thus formed can be transferred into the woman. So that way she can have the possibility of becoming pregnant, but only thing is the genetic material will not be the same of the mother. It will be of the donor and her husband. Okay, so this is egg donation. Okay, patient is saying, no, I want only my genetic material. What else can we do, doctor? Is there another solution? Of course, now recently we are having this new technology, what we are using as stem cell therapy, where we are retrieving the stem cells from the bone marrow of the iliac crest, we are processing these stem cells and directly injecting these stem cells into the ovary. Now, usually, no, I'm not one of those people who do a lot of these kind of experimental therapies. But, you know, one of the patients what whom I had was very persistent that I do this. So I, I thought, okay, fine, I'll go ahead and try this out. She had had multiple IVF failures before, as in she had two to three multiple IVF failures before because, of course, her AMH was very less. 
uh, and her uh, oocyte quality was very poor. So no one expected her to become pregnant, right? So I do this stem cell because she has asked me to do the stem cell. And then uh, my plan was after doing stem cell, maybe after two or three months, I'll do an ICSI, get all the eggs outside, make the embryo and then transfer it back in, hoping that I will get better, um, uh, better quality embryos. But then finally what happened, within two months, she called me back and said, doctor, I got pregnant naturally. So, even though I don't really believe in these experimental therapies, I still feel when things like this happen to you, you know, in your own practice, you can see that there is a scope for this, but definitely a lot more research has to be done because we need to have standardization. We need to know how many times to give PRP or sorry, or the stem cell therapy, how often should we go, uh, I mean, how often should we give it or when should we, uh, you know, after how long, after giving the stem cell therapy, should we go ahead and retrieve the follicles? So there are a lot of questions which need to be answered. So definitely, I still feel there's a lot of scope in this, however. So this is what I wanted to bring to your attention, mainly as, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, young doctors in our uh, uh, fraternity who are trying to, you know, really climb up the ladder. You know, you want to become doctors, you want to do all your studies before. Think of fertility preservation as your friend. Okay, now they previously there used to be a lot of taboos around uh, fertility preservation, but nowadays it's not the case anymore. This is the best way to save one's fertility. Why is it that we go and put money in the bank? We can always keep our money with our, in our hands, no? It's because there's a chance that you lose your money, okay? You have a much better chance of this uh, staying in the bank. And more importantly, there's a, once you keep this, uh, or, you know, once you preserve your eggs, what happens is they will be the same quality of when you have preserved it. So if you are some of those, or if you are someone who has already have a vision of doing more things in the future, if you want to plan for fertility preservation, the earliest time is as early as you want it. Because the earlier you preserve the eggs, the higher chance of pregnancy to happen in a later date. It's not like everybody, not like 100% of the people who have their fertility preserved require, uh, you know, require uh, uh, an, uh, an, an egg, uh, sorry, uh, they might require an IVF procedure or, you know, use these uh, preserved e eggs later. It's just that, you know, it's more like a safety protocol. It's just like taking an insurance. We don't take insurance because we know that we're going to have a problem later. We take it so that if in case we are having an issue later, we'll always have something to fall back on. So that is how you have to look at fertility preservation. Okay. And cryopreservation and oocyte freezing has become so common. So many... doctors you know themselves go ahead and get this monitor counsel every one of you about of course there are also immunological uh, things but i don't want to get into immunology because you know that's a whole different topic it will take a lot of time and i think we have already you know I, I i said i'll give you a talk for 30 minutes i don't want to take it beyond that and now a lot of research has been going on in ai okay artificial intelligence you will ask me doc how will ai help you know, AI can help in a lot of things. It can individualize the doses for how much we have to give to the patient. It will individualize for each patient on when we have to do the egg collection. It will individualize which embryo to use, you know, after doing a time lapse. And it will individualize the best chance of the patient to have a successful pregnancy. Once AI comes into the picture, the current global average of IVF pregnancies right now is around 30 to 35 percent as in the success rate now once the AI comes to the picture I believe that this 30 to 35 percent can be shot up all the way to 60 percent which I think is required for us at this moment because you can see the amount of the global uh, you know the fertility is on the decrease and we are here to actively make sure that doesn't happen. You know, unfortunately, the whole humanity will be at stake. But anyway, I think, you know, definitely going into the future, there's lots more technologies are there to come. And I think a lot more exciting things to look forward to in gynecology as well. So I hopefully persuaded some of you to join, you know, gynec and, you know, infertility practice today. Thank you for patient sharing. Thank you so much, sir. Yes.
So yes. uh, now we move on to the question and answer session. So Suhavi is a member of MSFC. She's going to take over now and handle the Q&A. Okay. Good evening, sir. Hi, good evening, Havi. I'm good, sir. Uh, thank you so much for the session, sir. It was incredibly informative. And we are going to move to the question answer round. I'll ask the participants to raise their hands whoever want to ask questions. I'll unmute Perfect. them turn by turn. Perfect. Okay. If anyone has a question, they can put it in the chat box as well and we'll just read it out for you. So we have uh, Suhani who wanted to ask a question. I'd request Suhani to please unmute herself and ask the question if that's okay. Uh, ma'am, am I audible? Yes, yes I you can are. Hear you. I can hear you. Um, so, I wanted to know this uh, stem cell therapy, which is said that is being done on an experimental basis, uh, in which case, if people want to preserve their own DNA in their children. Uh, so, what are the disadvantages of this uh, technique? I mean, it is an invasive procedure. And you don't really don't have any data on it, isn't it? So the disadvantage is it's as as medical practitioners, we don't want to do anything without data. So unless there is strong evidence towards doing some procedure, we generally don't want to do it. So unless the patient really requests it, these are procedures which you tend to avoid as much as possible. So the disadvantage is there is no data. That is that is the main disadvantage uh, 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 to what I can see. Uh, data regarding this particular technique having any uh, negative side effects? I mean, we don't know, isn't it? Uh, we don't know what is the impact of putting stem cells in the ovary uh, because it's only being tried right now. So only if in case we have evidence that, you know, putting in the future, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of things that we need to look into, right? Because because stem cells are again totally potent, isn't it? They can they can become any kind of uh, uh, cell. So if they become hyperactive, will will there be a possibility for it? Or because we are pricking it inside, that itself can be used as an insult, and then you know at which point it can um, uh, you know uh, uh, become cancerous. So we really don't know. So that is why we want to take it with a word of caution. We always tell the counsel the patients about all the things what can happen and then only if they agree and they consent for it, we should take them up for such procedures. So I have a question here. It says uh, from Akshay Agarwal who asks super ovulation versus hyperstimulation syndrome. So hyperstimulation syndrome is something is more like, you know, we try to avoid hyperstimulation syndrome because when patients have PCOD and then you give very high doses of uh, FSH or recombinant FSH, they have a chance of ha developing hyperstimulation syndrome. Hyperstimulation syndrome, you want to avoid. Whereas super ovulation, you want to accept. So super ovulation is when you have only around maybe maximum of around 10 follicles and hyperstimulation is when you have like 20 follicles and the estrogen level is very, 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 very high. So you know that the patient might be getting hyperstimulated soon. So definitely, of course, it is very manageable nowadays. Previously, it used to be much more unmanageable, but now it's uh, much more manageable. And of course, we also know that we can tighter the doses for these patients. So the amount of hyperstimulation uh, cases have come down also a lot due to frozen embryo transfers because usually they, if they do the stimulation immediately and then they do transfer immediately, then the patient will have a hyper, higher chance of hyperstimulation syndrome because the HCG will keep getting increased during pregnancy and you might have to terminate the pregnancy as well. So I would say that, um, you know, they're both different things. The scope of ART for same-sex couples, again, you need to understand 
uh, for same sex couples the uh, government of india does not give any special considerations so until the government really comes up with things like you know surrogacy programs for same sex couples i don't think we will be able to uh, use those things and again when it comes to same sex couples who are uh, uh, women there are a lot more i would say lenient as in they can say they can use a donor sperm and get pregnant that is okay but for when it comes to two males i don't think they have a chance of uh, getting a surrogate um i mean there are ways but you know of course there will be a lot of things to pull um cryopreservation of embryos versus cryopreservation of eggs very good question if you ask me i would say a cryopreservation of embryo is much more better than cryopreservation of eggs because your retrieval rates after the thawing process is much better with embryos but nowadays no with the new thawing cycles even eggs also are equally good so actually right now in the current scenario current scenario i would say there's not much of a difference but however because you know previously maybe around 10 years back uh, cryopreservation of embryos had a much more better yield than the eggs so now it's much better is there a limitation of the number of times cryopreserved eggs can be used absolutely not you can use the embryos as uh, the eggs how many of them are there you can use them that's your choice i mean only depends on how many you want to save for example if you get 20 follicles and all of them are grade a there's no point of having so many embryos saved isn't it it's just you're just going to be paying a lot more when you don't have to what are the measures to avoid pcos or pcod you can't avoid pcod everybody has it okay so just try to see whenever you talk about pcod try to realize where the problem is is it the fact that you are very bothered that you have pcod or do you have some symptoms of pcod so if in case it's the symptoms all symptoms can be solved individually for example if you are having you know excessive hair gain then you go go for laser therapy if you are having you know acne pigmentation go for retinol therapy so there is so much you can do so find out the reason why you are talking about pcod and this get the treatment thing yes anjali has a very good question she is asking about uh, future of genetic modification in art trust me there are certain countries where genetic modification is being done already they call it the three parent uh, you know three parent ivf where they take the mitochondria from the third parent and then they put it into the egg of the uh, you know uh, the mother's egg and then they do the exe process and you know what babies are born only thing is we don't know the identity of these babies neither we don't know how they are going to grow so this is going to be a long term thing definitely not your batch maybe the batch after that we will be able to see a lot of genetic modifications in art but then again now with the new advent of i mean with with ai and the things how things are going maybe in your generation as well we will be able to see a lot of genetic modifications a very good question okay uh is there any limit to how many ivf treatments a woman can undergo generally we don't have any such limit but usually if you were asked me i would say anyone beyond 6 cycles it's it's time to look for other options who is the third parent usually third parent when i'm saying third parent i'm talking about a donor it can be anyone so you know it, it, it doesn't have to be a family member so we have some children who raised their hands uh, snehil can you please uh, unmute yourself and ask the question hi good evening sir good evening sir uh, sir i'm snehil chabla uh, i'm uh, i'm a fourth year mba student from aims rishikesh so oh, lovely so uh, sir basically i wanted you to tell me that what uh, inspired you as a young mba student to you know take a gynecology <laughs> because i personally i'm i'm i am uh, motivated partially but i i really want someone to inspire me 
and also uh, how was your how how is your experience as a male kayak and like any challenges that you faced or something you would like to tell me about yes i think uh, when it comes to my experience for me because my father was a gynecologist as well it was an easier transition for me I, my plan initially was you know i was looking at the path of least resistance uh, but but you know before that i did try my hand in emergency medicine but unfortunately by the year i wanted to join that that got de recognized so <laughs> my father said you have no other luck you, you have to come join me only so you you know uh, take up uh, option gyni so yes that was one of the main reasons why i got into it but once i got into it now uh, since i used to see my dad and how he used to uh, you know work and how he used to counsel the patients i found that very fascinating i thought like you know definitely i should be able to do this and i think a uh, mentorship is very very important uh, the moment you decide you want to take one field i would always say you take your time anyway you have to prepare for your neat exam take your time and join a mentor see how their daily routines are you know try to understand is this something that i want to do for the rest of my life for me it was an easier one i didn't have to go look at anybody else my father was my mentor so for me it was quite simple but if you ask me uh, trying to find a mentor in the field that you are interested in is very 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 important i think that that should be your main focus um and as far as uh, being a male gynecologist yes of course you are going to have resistance in india because you are in india um it's not like you know uh, people are very willing if in case you have five gynecologists sitting and out of them uh, you know four are males and one is female the female is going to have all the patients <laughs> okay so you, you you know as a male it's going to be very challenging for you to you know convince the patients you are good but you know thanks to today's social media and the way you can you can you can force your vision on your patients as in you give your philosophy because everyone has their own treating philosophy no matter how many books you read you have a particular way of treating your patients you know and the patients see that they 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 get that from your communication and once they are convinced they they will uh, they will always be your patient so i would say you know find your niche and um, and you know stick to it you, you you'll be fine thank you sir thank you. thank you thank you i hope i answered all your questions yes yeah uh, i request padma to kindly unmute herself and ask the question uh good afternoon sir uh, i'm also from srm oh lovely uh, nice padma i was just telling yes, aditi that you know i was from srmc as well you know yes sir several years ago it's, it's like a distant uh, dream now <laughs> So, yes, good, good. Yes, so, sir. I uh, wanted to know if there is a uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Would we try for an ovulation induction again? And also, like, how do we prevent OHS? Yes. I think the way you prevent OHS is quite straightforward. You always you once a patient has OHS, the second time you stimulate her, you have to make sure that you are going to lower the dose, okay. and you can start monitoring the E two levels. that is probably the best way to know if in case the patient will hyperstimulate and if you feel that she is going to hyperstimulate you can always coast the cycle you can do coasting and you can plan to do it on the next cycle so only thing is and another way of how we can prevent ohss is instead of going ahead for a hcg so there are two ways of how we can trigger the ovulation to occur i'm sorry <laughs> it is a new apple one okay so there are two ways of how you can uh, you know avoid um, uh, the stimulation that is number one is lowering the dose the other one is you can go ahead and you can uh, give a antagonist trigger instead of giving a hcg trigger because hcg trigger again will shoot up your hcg levels and mm -hmm. beta hcg levels keep growing up then you know you're going to have more uh, symptoms of ohss so ideally you want to bring down the beta hcg levels and the best way to do that is by giving a agonist trigger thank you sir yeah. so we have one question in the chat box uh, the question is from kusumita hello sir is there a risk of development uh, is there a risk to develop breast cancer and endometrial cancer in women who opt for egg preservation due to hormonal therapy no not at all see hormonal therapy no we've been i told you no we have been doing this till nine since 1978 we have so much solid data which shows that injecting hormones are a part of your body okay 
how can hormones be you know uh, negatively impacting you it's not possible and most of the hormones have very short half life they get out of your system very easily so it's only that treatment cycle of maybe one or two months you will be undergoing any kind of medications the next 72 hours later you will we'll be out of your system so i don't think that should be a limiting factor for you and there is no data or evidence showing that there is a development of brassia or endometrial cancer or any kind of cancer for that sort after an ivf pregnancy or due to stimulation there is no data on that uh this last question uh, we received one of the questions in the forms and the question was what was your experience like when you did your first surgery independently <laughs> oh um it was good you know it was in my post graduation because it was probably one of the most surreal experiences i would have had because you know as ugs you know we hardly used to put you know one or two incisions or we used to not forget incision we used to put like you know one or two uh, sutures at the end of the procedure that do you know we used to do it for a um, uh, how do you say episiotomy wound okay the moment i got into pg like my very second day of labor posting they uh, they just gave me the knife and said you know go ahead and do the surgery <laughs> so that was my experience so it was surreal and um, it was a great experience and you know it gave me a lot of confidence saying that yes observation skills are very 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 important you know all of us you, we keep saying you know hands on hands on hands on more important than hands on is your observational skills because when you observe you learn and you get up all the smallest uh, details so the more you observe the more better you become as a surgeon and it also reduces your learning curve as well so definitely i think you know if in case you have an opportunity don't really worry about hands on because what's more important is what's recorded in your brain so you go ahead and you observe look at each and every moment what the doctors are doing look at their hand movements look at those gestures try to learn those if the, if you are interested in a surgery that is so definitely you know i think observation is very important for you at this age and once you guys have gone into specializations then of course you know you'll get enough hands to become good surgeons as of my experience uh, this was the way i got into uh, my my first surgery <laughs> um sneha has raised his hand okay uh, i guess he wants to ask some questions yeah 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 sir sorry to disturb you again i just wanted yes. to uh, i wanted you to throw some light on cosmetic gynecology like i've been hearing about it my college in here there yeah but i've never had a you know person who's there doing it to talk okay about. see cosmetic gynecology if you ask me you know it's a misnomer right it is nothing cos i mean there are cosmetic aspects to it but what we mainly focus on is the functional aspects for example women who are suffering from stress urinary incontinence you know the dribbling of urine every time they sneeze or they cough you have no idea about the number of young women even before their deliveries are having this issue now how many of these women we need to resort to surgery not required no so through functional gynecology also known as cosmetic gynecology we are able to solve these issues and the other one what we do is vaginismus you have no idea about the number of girls who are suffering from vaginismus uh, you know I, like ever since i did that video in 2019 i've been having patients at least 20 to 25 patients every month who call me and saying doctor you know i have this condition i have vaginismus so treating vaginismus also comes as a part of cosmetic gynecology again functional so a gsm genito urinary syndrome of menopause all of those symptoms are also being solved by uh, you know cosmetic gynecology so it's a lot of um, functional aspects to it the cosmetic part why it stuck the name stuck is because you know it's always more fun to say cosmetic right cosmetic gynecology it just sticks isn't it so that's the reason why we use the word cosmetic but yes there are definitely functional aspects to it the cosmetic part if you ask me is mainly not uh something which i see india taking it up for the next at least 8 years 8 to 10 years minimum 
because we are not there yet and even if in case you're looking at the cosmetic part it's most of the time who require this cosmetic uh, part are the mexicans or the uh, you know the the uh, african americans they are the ones who require more of this procedures than our indian women so generally i don't see much of a scope in terms of uh, the cosmetic bit of cosmetic gynecology but functional bit definitely there's a big scope thank you sir So let's move to the last question of the session. Okay. We have received one question in the chat box uh, from Suhani. What is the most common reason that people with infertility don't come to hospitals, apart from the fact that the person may well be unaware? Uh, what is the most common reason that people with infertility don't come to hospitals? What is the common reason? Because it's, I'll tell you the most common reason, you, it, it's not surprising at all. Nobody believes or they think that they're infertile, okay? <laughs> Obviously, right? Why would you consider yourself to have any infertility issue? It's not like, you know, out of the blue, you think, you know, oh, okay. It's only that when it stops I and mean, it doesn't happen after four or five years, you're thinking, okay, maybe there is something that we need to check out. But otherwise, it doesn't really click. That's the reason why many people don't really go in for treatment. Not that, you know, they're not aware or something. They, they would have heard. They would have thought, oh, okay, maybe my friends might require, oh, these people might require. They will never put themselves in that position. <laughs> so that is the main reason why many people don't uh, seek treatment initially. Thank you so much, sir, for this question answer session round. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that was really enriching. Uh, okay, guys, that's all the time we have today. Let's hope we have another session with Sir again and we can ask the rest of your doubts. Um, just a request to everyone, please turn on your camera so we can take a momento meet, uh, picture, please. Is it done? Uh, uh, one second. I'll just take now. Yeah. Okay. Three, two, one. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for having me. It was lovely to interact with all of you. Thank you all for the questions. It was wonderful talking to all of you. If you have any further questions, please uh, please feel free to uh, you know ask me on Instagram. I'm always available there. My mail ID is dr at drsurashad.com. If you have any queries, anything you want to know where to do what, you know, if you want some kind of guidance, you know, always feel free to ask me. I'm always available. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Guys, go follow sir on Instagram. It's Dr. Yes. Devi Maker. Yes. Please. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Are we sending the feedback from Ruthie? Uh, yes. One second. Uh, Vedam, can you send that? 